Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations, Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Well, this sucks. Okay, uh, I got uh, Charles Whitwam on the line, and for the guys who listen to this show, or guys and gals actually who listen to this show regularly, they'll know who Charles is. He's uh, he's the founder of uh, How for Wildlife, and uh, um, Charles, thanks for taking a couple minutes to hop on and chat with some Canadians. I love it. Thank you for having me on, and and nice to meet you. I don't think you're, I think we were just saying we haven't met yet. Yeah. So nice to meet you. Yeah. So um, Charles, you know one of the one of the things I find extremely important now. Canada and the U.S., I mean, we share a lot of things, uh, We, you know, with that long, big, contiguous border. Um, but one thing, you know, I find really important is is that we support, as hunters on both sides of the borders, we support each other. And, uh, you know, you got uh, you got quite a bit going on down there, as we do up here. And it's, it's easy to forget, um, you know, that we need support both on both sides of the border you know when something comes to action you know we had lots of support up here in british columbia specifically with um the 7b stuff um you guys stepped up and you guys helped us tremendously and i think that was a huge wake-up call for the government um in british columbia and not only in british columbia the, the other provinces um so there's one bill actually right now that's going on that kind of hits close to home for british columbians it's the uh it's the one in montana regarding the grizzly bear do you got uh, can you and you know in maybe 30 yeah. seconds can you just briefly explain what's going on um yeah so the u.s um fish and wildlife service the grizzly bears are, are listed as an endangered species currently um and however the numbers of grizzly bear according to even u.s fish and wildlife biologists all the biologists in montana they are five to six times uh, the endangered species uh, limit. So mm-hmm. there's like 2,000 grizzly bear or possibly more um, in in Montana. So they've so Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana has requested to delist grizzly bear, and Montana has a management plan which basically covers all of the criteria that that they think they would need to submit to the U S fish and wildlife service to delist them. So an environmental, uh, in, impact plan, um, or study, um, basically they just want to be able to manage their own animals. And right now they can't do that. And grizzly bear are not endangered. I mean, by definition, they are, you know, they're labeled as endangered, but their numbers say otherwise. So mm-hmm. it's time, it's time to give that back to, uh, to Montana to manage. And as far as hunting goes, it's such a small part of this. I mean, if there is hunting, it, it mentions hunting in the plan. It's like takes up maybe four pages of a few hundred page plan. Um, hunting is going to be extremely limited, maybe 20 tags maximum. So this is about delisting first. And where it goes from there is going to depend on the numbers and the management and how it all shakes out. But this is a, a long, this would be a long, long term plan. So yeah. don't get too excited about the hunting. There yeah. could, there could be some, <laughs> but you know, yeah, there's, yeah. On, there's only 2000 animals. So, you know, what's, what's the, you know, 20 animals possibly for hunting. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, you know, we faced the same thing up here in, in British Columbia in 2017. It was, um, you know, it was a political shutdown of, of the grizzly bear hunt and down in the politicians felt a lot of pressure down in Vancouver regarding, you know, it being a so-called trophy hunt. Um, but I mean, like in British Columbia, there's absolutely no shortage of grizzly bears. Um, so, um, yeah, this one, this is why I kind of, you know, when I seen this and, and I was talking to John the other day about it and, uh, you know, kind of hit close to home because, 
Um, you know, it, it's obviously a little different scenario than it is up here in British Columbia, but I mean, you know, uh, again, um, it's still tied to, to, um, to what's going on up here. So it's important for, for us as Canadians to, you know, to, you know, every once in a while, click on these plays, go over to howlforwildlife.org, click on these, uh, take actions and just, you know, um, you know, see what's going on around because there is so many issues that, that happen down there that, you know, just because they're not, they don't say Canada on them or a specific province doesn't mean that, uh, they can't use that as a precedent, um, for something mm -hmm. else going on down there. Cause the thing with you get these, you get these, um, you know, you get up here, we have Pacific wild, but you get Pep, PETA and all those other groups. They don't, I don't think they have, they don't see borders, um, either. Do you know what I mean? Like I, they, <laughs> they talk back and forth quite a bit. And, you know, if let's just say up here in British Columbia, say they get rid of uh, a black bear hunt, um, which they are trying, you know, they don't right now is, is one of their, their actions. They want to get rid of the black bear hunt. Um, you know, but what's it going to be after that, right? They're not, they're not going to stop doing what they do and they're going to keep, they're going to keep looking for something. And if it's, if it's up to them, you know, or if it's, if it, it means supporting issues that are going on to stop a hunt down in the U S then that's what they're going to do. So it's important for us to, yeah. to do the same and band together. Oh yeah. No, you're hundred percent. There's definitely no borders as far as the anti hunting crowd goes, but there's also no borders. Um, I mean, Canada is just an extension of, of, of certainly what we've been trying to say, like we say, Hey, if you live in Missouri, you need to be concerned about what's going on in Washington state because, because the anti hunters know no borders, these issues will get to your state. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If, if, yeah. if they win in Washington, they will eventually get to your state. And plus we hunt, you know, hunters don't know borders. We hunt out of state. We hunt out of country. Yeah. Um, you know, grizzly bear, they don't know border just for, they don't know what the borders are. Right. Yeah. So they're going between Canada and Montana all the time and, and, you know, and vice versa. So yeah, certainly important for the sake of wildlife, but it's also, it's the way humans work, you know, um, there's, we work on trends, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we like to kind of get on the, the hype train of things. So the better we can do on, on wildlife issues, and let's say, you know, helping to get grizzly bear delisted, uh, there's going to be a scientific reason for that. And science doesn't really know any borders either. You know what I mean? So yeah. that, that can be carried over to Canada and vice versa. So God, and you mentioning black bears being, that would be insane. There's so many black bear in British Columbia. That would be just absolutely wild uh, to do that. But if you think about it, they don't, if they can, if they can accomplish, the Anaheim hunters can accomplish um banning basically all predator hunting that's going to have such a negative effect on ungulates mm -hmm. that the numbers are going to be so low that our hunting opportunity is going to decrease which i think is part of their plan i think they understand that they're not right. stupid do you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah absolutely yeah so um there's there's definitely some we just need we need activists on the hunter side yeah we we have to um, stop arguing back and forth about all these stupid oh. little things, you know, like you're not a real hunter if you don't do this or whatever. Who cares? Yeah, the other yeah. side doesn't do that. Yeah, they're kind of in competition with raising money in this organ, this organ, this organ, but they are hand in hand in their fight. Yeah. And we aren't like it's it's like pulling teeth to try to get, you know, non people who've never hunted bear involved in a bear issue or, mm -hmm. you know, take any species, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, the point is, is it is your battle. Mm -hmm. They're just picking on, you know, one battalion, you know, think about it as you're the entire army and yeah. we have all these battalions or platoons, however you want to kind of, uh, put that in your mind, but it is your battle and we all have to fight for each other. 100%. We got to take lessons from the other side and why they've been so successful. Yeah, absolutely. And the way you guys have, the way you've set it up, I mean, it makes it so easy. Um, I mean, the guys sign up for the, for the, you know, get on the email list and it pops right into your email and it takes two minutes. I mean, and a little goes a long way. And, and like, we've seen that firsthand with, with what happened up here uh, with the seven B issue. And you know, that, you know, all the polit politicians I talked to regarding that issue, they're like, they couldn't believe it. They're like, wow. I think a lot of people, that was a wake up call for them. They're like, holy shit. Like 
they receive th- each each MLA received thousands and thousands of emails regarding that issue. Um, yeah. So and yeah, up in Canada, that's you know we don't have the hunting numbers that you guys have down here. So you you know that that's huge for us. That was awesome. yeah. Um, you know, and that's also that's so good to hear. It um, it speaks to the uniqueness of our of our deliverable uh system it's it's set up completely differently so mm-hmm. they're not getting canned letter your mlas weren't getting the same letter mm-hmm. i don't remember how many we had built into the system there but it's it's randomized and it's it's a variety of different messages so if you don't write your own message which you can you just use what we have pre-written there each user sees a different message so on the decision makers end MLAs in your case, they're seeing a they're seeing a different email body from each individual that sends a message in. It's not yeah. the same letter over and over and over again, which is really easy to filter. Their staff can filter that because the subject lines are the same. So our subject lines are all different as well. Totally randomized, mm-hmm. um, which makes it super personable, uh, personal and uh so that's good to hear when you say that that they couldn't believe the the feedback that they were getting. Um, I think I need to hear that more because that's that's kind of a, a testament to our system working and and kind of the overall one of the main goals that I wanted to accomplish was was actually reaching the decision makers with um with something that they can't easily filter with something where they can't say this is just a canned message. All right, it all says the yeah. same. Let's really read what these what these messages say. Uh, yeah, that is yeah. important. Yeah, they make way more of an impact if it's like you said, if it's not just one generic message going out to all, because they they're gonna sit there and be like, well, I got an email from, you know, Kevin Toy, and it said this, and then another MLA is gonna be like, I got the same email, but they don't, right? They're like, yeah, well, yeah. there's obviously, you know, it forces them to take a deeper look and be like, okay, listen, th- we're this isn't going unnoticed, and you know these. This, this group of people isn't going to stand for it. So yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to let you go. I just wanted to get you on briefly, just, uh, you know, to introduce yourself to, to uh, my platform and to Canadians. And uh, you know, I, again, guys, it's really important that you, you jump on that how for wildlife.org page and uh, take action. And uh, one quick question, Charles, if, if there's an issue up going on up here in Canada, um, how do folks, make you aware of it can they just go on the on the web page email you and yeah. uh and yeah there's tell like, you what's going on yeah there's a contact us on there um or you know just info at howforwildlife.org that comes right, right to me yeah and i do have a we have our first hire <laughs> which is so exciting because <laughs> this has been essentially a two-man team yeah um which has been insane but i have a new hire who's um who's going to be tackling these issues with me and, and really helping out on that. So, you know, I don't want to, I want to be involved in all of the, any issue that's in going on in Canada as possible. Um, up until now, it's been difficult because I'm trying to keep up with, with what yeah. we have going on here. Um, but uh, with that hire and with some future hires coming, I think we can, we can take on all the issues. So. Yeah, yeah, just reach out to me or message me. The thing is on Instagram, I I'm not lying. I get probably a hundred messages a day. Yeah, I bet. And um I just you know, and some of them go into the request folder and some of them it's so unorganized the way it's set up, and I I don't see everybody's messages. It's it's just impossible. Yeah, absolutely. And uh and for those who are emailing, make sure it's you know it's got validity to it. It's not just somebody's hunting in your hunting spot and you don't like it. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, Charles. And for the listeners, we're gonna we're gonna dive into this uh, take action plan or or this call to action regarding that grizzly bear uh, hunt in Montana that Charles and I were talking about. So hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, again, yep, yeah, do what you can. Thanks, guys. Welcome to Howlcast. Before we get into this episode, I want to take a few moments to talk to you. First, I'd like to thank you all for all the support that you've given Howl. And uh, I just want to let you know that Howl only works when you're involved and the only way we can preserve our way of life is to stay connected to the issues and continue to make our voices heard also i'd like to talk to you quickly about the different ways you could be a part of helpful wildlife at the very least we hope you will become a pack member 
and opt into our emails. This is our free membership program. This helps you stay connected to the issues surrounding hunting, fishing, and wildlife management. Uh, it's super easy. You just a few clicks, you know, and uh, and you're in. It's pretty easy. And next would be our paid membership, which is a thirty dollar a year membership, and this gives you access to deeper discounts, more rewards, and special giveaways. Lastly, I want to talk to you about our partnership programs like Go Hunt and now Pope and Young Club. With the Go Hunt program, you can go to their website right now and you can buy their membership for $149 or you could purchase it from Howl and you would get our $30 membership included free and have access to additional discounts and benefits to go purchase stuff from the Go Hunt store. So it's kind of a no-brainer. You could spend $149 to purchase it on their website, or you could spend $149 to purchase it on Howl for Wildlife. And when you do so, when you purchase it from Howl, they will give 50% of your membership will be donated to Howl for Wildlife. So it's kind of brainless, like I said. I mentioned Pope and Young. So we have a new program with the Pope and Young Club. So if you ever wanted to become a member of Pope and Young, now is the time to do it. Because you can get both the Pope and Young membership and the Howl for Wildlife membership for the same price that you would normally purchase your Pope and Young membership, which is $45 a year. Again, kind of brainless. Get benefits of both. You're helping out both organizations and you just get way more for your money. One more thing I want to talk to you about. If you use Onyx, I use Onyx. It's an excellent program figure out all my waypoints, figure out how I'm going to get into places, how I'm going to make stalks. There's so many different ways you can use Onyx. It's an amazing product. Um, if you already have it or if you never had it before, you can use the promo code HOWL, uh, H-O-W-L, all caps, and you will save 20% off on that membership. Plus, Onyx will donate an additional 20% to Howl for Wildlife. You can't beat that, right? So you're helping yourself, saving some money. You're helping out the organization. It's awesome. All right. That's all I got for you. Let's get into this episode. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Howlcast. And today we are going to be discussing grizzly bear, if I'm not mistaken. Sometimes I just say wolf because I get the two. They're kind of on the same plane with a lot of people but no today is grizzly bear and with regards to montana and we have uh in the you guys are both in the state of montana right now currently right you bet yeah. okay yeah. so we have uh keith kubista is that how i say your last name kubista it's kubista kubista and we also have jeff dara and uh those two gentlemen are both well i'll let you guys kind of introduce uh yourselves keith who who are you what do you do and um and then we'll go to jeff next sure glad to participate and thank you for having us on absolutely i'm uh, keith cabista i'm a resident of montana have been for upwards of 25 years i'm in an organization that i uh, more or less helped found back in 2009 called montana sportsman for fish and wildlife and we uh originated because we were going through the, I'll just call it the wolf wars at that time, where they were listed on the endangered species list. Our game management agency was struggling with it and pretty much politically hogtied to do anything and reluctant to do some stuff at the same time. So a bunch of us formed and decided we'd get in the fray. And we've been at it in that regard on not only wolves, but all game management and wildlife management to protect, preserve the hunting, trapping and fishing rights, of not only our members, but citizens throughout the state. And so many things are affected with wildlife, overlapping agricultural industries, land use, private property rights, et cetera. So we work on all of that, but our primary function is to uh, ensure that our members and our citizens continue to enjoy and appreciate the right to hunt, trap, and fish. And I'm a director in the organization now. I'm a past president of the organization. So uh, I've kind of been around through the early days and the later stages of everything that we've been involved with. And uh, 
be happy to answer any questions about our organization as well as anything that we're engaged in right now, which happens to be primarily fending off lawsuits by the radical enviros against wolf hunting and trapping, as well as trying to get grizzly bears delisted in the state and under state-based management. I'll leave it go with that, and uh, Jeff can pick it up probably. He's uh, the smart one of the bunch. <laughs> well, he told me you were the smart one of the bunch, so yeah. I don't know. That's 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 a good uh, good synergy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, go. you want me to go, or do you want Matt to go? Yeah, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm Jeff Dara, and uh, I live in the Bitterick Valley, um, same as Keith. Uh, we're about uh, 30 miles south of Missoula, Montana. Um, I was a game warden for most of my life for the state of Montana, uh, about 27 years before I retired. And um, I joined Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I was a, a director. I think I've been there, I don't know, four years now, close to it. Um, I was a director uh, like Keith. And um, then our organization decided that they wanted to uh, create an executive director position um, to be a little bit more active. That was one of the things that I heard when I started um, with Montana SFW, that they wanted to have their voice heard a little bit more. Um, there are some, act there, as any state where there are a lot of resources, there are a lot of sportsmen's organizations. And... Um, some of them, uh, their voices are listened to and are louder than others. And so uh, to get that proverbial seat at the table, you have to have an executive director position. And uh, hence, I'm the first executive director for Montana Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. And uh, like Keith, um, I've been in Montana for, well, I moved here in 1980 and uh, went to school here and uh, enjoy it. Hunt, fish, trap, love Montana. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. By the way, Joe um, at uh, American Bear Foundation says hi. Oh, yeah. yeah. I just, we're working on something uh, together. And I spoke with him yesterday. I said, I was talking to him about this issue. And he said, oh, he's a good friend of mine. Tell him I said hi. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, Matt. So, Matt is a new the first hire actually with with Howl for wildlife which i'm really excited about because it's going to take some work um off of my back but um matt this is um sort of the first public first thing we've really done together actually so um who are you who are you matt introduce yourself real quick uh my name's matt Smythe. i hail from western new york is where i live live now uh, i'm a, uh, an army veteran uh writer and an outdoorsman. I hunt and fish, um, primarily, primarily archery for whitetail up here. Um, and fish, it runs the gamut. So you know, if it swims, I love chasing it. Um, I was, uh, with free range American. I was a, a senior staff writer for them and wrote a lot, covered a lot of, um, environmental conservation, wildlife, uh, issues and uh wrote wrote a lot and worked a lot with charles um on different issues that that they were trying to bring uh some some action to so uh, i'm excited to excited to support Char charles and uh, be part of the howl organization and really look forward to uh moving the needle on a lot of these issues i'm i'm super excited to have you here um yeah, your your work with Free Range American and all the other guys over there have been honestly really invaluable to to us because I didn't have anybody writing anything. Um, and I'm not really that smart and I'm not a very good writer, so <laughs> I rely on a lot of people. But um but anyways, um I'm Charles. I'm the uh, president and founder of Halfer Wildlife. And basically what happened was I saw, uh, I think a couple of people probably messaged me as generally how this works, or somebody sent me an email that um, there's going to be an issue going on. And this one happens to be in Montana and it's going to have something to do with grizzly bears. So Jeff and I have spoken in the past. I can't remember what about, but I said, I know a guy in Montana. So I, 
I think I called you or emailed you. I said, Hey, um, this is what's going on. Are you going to be involved in this? And he said, yep, we absolutely are. And so we had a, a brief conversation. I said, let's just do a podcast. Let's not even talk about it. Um, really let's, let's figure this out through a podcast. And what we're going to do is kind of educate everybody on what's going on, educate myself and Matt, and we're going to take from this, um, and develop an action um that uh that the public can then use through our website to to you know get involved in this grizzly issue and basically right now it's and correct me if i'm wrong the department is going to have a a new grizzly bear management plan and right now they're accepting public comments up until i think january 5th or january 6th so that's where currently right now where i think we can get involved is just um letting everyone know what the issue is and here's how to make comments and here's some suggestions about those comments based on these conversations and you know based on kind of the i think the experts in the field um so we are we're starting with you guys seem to be pretty good uh references that i've that i've gotten on this and other people that i've talked to that said oh man that's going to be a great like those are the two guys to talk to so i'm excited um this is just an open, you know, don't wait for me to ask you or whatever. I just want to know what's going on. So let's just start with, you know, whoever, um, what exactly is going on? What's the history? You know, there's a lot of, uh, controversy, I guess, or whatever surrounding grizzly bears. What's going on? Well, well, I'll, I'll start, I guess, uh, as, as everyone knows, the grizzly bear is a, is a listed species on the Endangered Species Act, and it has been now for decades. Um, Montana, the state of Montana, the governor has filed a petition with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the uh, Montana is not alone in that effort in the fact that Wyoming has done the same thing uh, with the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and uh, Idaho is, has also filed a petition to delist the grizzly bear. Um, that petition, I know for Montana, I can't speak for the dates of the other two states, but was filed just about a year ago. Um, and generally, uh, the general public was under the impression that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had 90 days to uh, reply to that petition. But in reality, it was they have a year and um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service still hasn't answered uh, the petition by Governor Greg Gianforte. So we're not sure if it's going to be if the bear is going to be allowed to be delisted or not. Um, but what we're talking about here today is is a draft management plan for grizzly bears by the state of Montana and the Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And uh, they've had uh, the, the plan, they actually had two plans in existence, but they, they, they're kind of antiquated. Um, and I'll explain one of the reasons why, but um, the two plans were for the bears in the western part of the state and then in the southwestern part of the state. So with the word delisting being said more than it has in decades uh, now, um, this plan that has been put together has actually been worked on by, um, trying to remember his name now, Dr. Harris, I believe is his name, uh, put this plan together. He's been working on it for two years. And there's um, something that has happened uh, during that time frame, was uh, the previous governor appointed a grizzly bear advisory council comprised of citizens of uh, all walks of life in Montana. And they met several times. And I know Keith listened to just about all of those meetings. Uh, I attended a couple. Um, and anyway, the, there was a lot of input uh, on grizzly bears and, and how, they, how the citizens felt they should be managed. Well, that input needs, is going to be incorporated in this draft plan. So it's, it's kind of twofold. It's going to consolidate the state's plan into one plan instead of two. And it's going to combine a lot of that effort that was put out with that uh, advisory group uh, 
on grizzly bears. And so right now there's a plan that's out for the public to see and uh, look at. There's kind of a short turnaround. There's a 30 day, uh, kind of like a 30 day window to get uh, public comment on this plan. And uh, in discussion with the department, there's a reason why um, delisting decision hasn't been made. And to not have uh, a current plan in place probably wouldn't bode well for delisting. So I, did I cover it kind of good, Keith? Did I forget anything? Yeah, I think that that brings it up to, to date where we are now. I'll, I'll just add a few things. And the, the one other important thing is combined with the plan, there's a requirement to do an environmental impact statement. That's also a part of the comment review process. Yeah. And from my perspective in dealing with some of these, I'll just call them uh, antis in the past, they're gonna hone in on a lot of those things. And that's where we're gonna need Howell's help along with other people's help to insist that this plan as well as the EIS is sufficiently documented science-based data inclusive that can produce a delisting at a certain point, but more than anything, to allow state-based management of the grizzly bears, similar to the way the wolf process went. And right. it's important to note at this point that uh, all the recovery criteria for the two ecosystems, Greater Yellowstone, as well as the Northern Continental Divide, have met that criteria years ago, and both times the delisting efforts were overthrown in litigation sponsored by the NGOs. And that's what we're trying to avoid now here is to do a, I'll just call it a, a fail safe if there is such a thing program that can avoid those type of things. Because these NGOs despise state-based management of wildlife. It it's goes against a lot of what their activities that they deem appropriate are. And that's mainly relating to hunting and lethal control. That's actually easier to manage grizzlies than it is to acquire management authority. I mean, we, we've struggled with that with the wolf and we're struggling it with the grizzly bears now, but support for this plan is essentially what's needed because without that, these groups are gonna prevent the listing once again after that rule is made by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So one of the key things I wanted to mention and the plan goes into it is, and that's why we're involved is, uh, we've laid a very consistent foundation referencing hunting of grizzlies in statute, regulations, plans, agreements, and a number of documents. So it's really critical and imperative that we continue to embed that within any plan as well as EIS studies. The current documents do that in a, I think, pretty nebulous way. And I can understand why, because they don't wanna give all of the detailed information, which will then become targets. But sure. it's a well-documented scientific hunting potential program that not only the department looked at and reviewed, but the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council looked at it and overwhelmingly supported it as well. I think there were 18 or 19 members on that council and all but two of the hardcore antis supported the role of hunting in a future management of grizzly bears. So um, I think that is about the only two points I wanted to add uh, at this point and maybe let you guys jump into questions or other things where we can address those. Well, <clears throat> one thing that I, I'm not, I'm not sure of, but I'm involved in a lot of states issues and I've been involved in a lot of commissions recently. And um, I see different groups, anti-hunting groups, or maybe they don't call themselves that, but they basically are. Um, and, and they go after states that do not have updated management plans. Um, and then they will say something, I mean, exactly what you're saying. They'll go after the environmental impact or they'll go after, you know, they'll say, well, in California recently, um, they actually got, <laughs> they got turned down. They'll say all the, uh, all the wildfires in California are, um, just wiping out the black bear population. Well, right. what they didn't know is our biologists were actually studying this 
to, I didn't even know it actually, um, all sorts of data points out there. And they actually said, well, actually the wildfires are helping the black bear population because of all the new growth of food. And there's nothing that supports that these wildfires have killed off, you know, such and such number of, uh, of black bear. And in fact, our black bear population is at least 35,000. And by the time we're done with this study, we might find we have 70,000. So HUSIS, the Humane Society of the United States, was not ready for that data. Um, but in some states where they don't have that data, man, do they they go after that. And you're just left defending something that you don't have any data for at the current time. So that's that's where they that's where they win. But I do want to just touch on black or not black bear, grizzly bear i'm so used to black bears that's all i've been dealing with lately but grizzly bear um hunting and i just want to hear from you guys i mean I, I i'm pretty sure i know the answer but i wonder sometimes if people think that we think there should be grizzly bear at all you know so are we managing grizzly bear or do we not want grizzly bear and um because it it when i read there i'll just ask you that what do you what's the what's the statement as far as you know is is do we want a population of any grizzly bear whatsoever in montana oh yeah i i would say absolutely i mean uh it's an iconic species it's our state animal they're cool to see um in no way uh, does our organization advocate that uh, there's an open season on grizzly bears? We know that if there gets to be that day that there's a hunting season on grizzly bears, that it'll be very, very regulated. Um, and, and I'm sure there will be instances where, I mean, about 80% of all grizzly bear death right now is human caused, one way or the other. Um, and the number one way a grizzly bear dies by that human cause is generally a vehicle strike mm. or, or a conflict. In other words, the grizzly came down and ripped the door off the chicken coop and killed the chickens. So grizzlies, <clears throat> grizzlies are being lost every year. Um, I, I know in the GYE, the greater Yellowstone, they're losing 50 to 70 bears a year. Same in Montana and the NCDE. To conflict and um but as far as hunting goes i think keith would agree we, we we don't see the day where you'll be able to go to walmart or whatever license agent you choose and buy a grizzly tag over the counter and go hunt grizzly bears we don't see that at all um i think there will be you know an opportunity someday uh for for someone to harvest a grizzly bear but again, using the North American model of conservation, uh, mm -hmm. one of the tenets of that, of that model is hunting. And um, if the population supports it, then we support it. And, uh, that's, I, that's how I look at it. I just wanted to make that comment because a lot of people listen to, I know the other side listens to this, and I see all the time in comments, and it's, it's frustrating to me. Yeah. I'll see some hunters. And it's, you know, um, this does not represent the hunting community, but when one person says something, that's what the other side uses as to paint all hunters. And I'll see all the time where it's like, you know, wipe them all out, kill them all. We don't want them all. And I'm like, well, that that's ridiculous. You know, that's not what we should be saying. That's not what we should be thinking. We, it's management. We want these animals, but they need to be managed. There's a, there's a, a um, you know, we kind of, use our biologists and we use scientists and we use all this data to kind of control what's going on you know too many predators is going to have an effect on ungulates and it's also going to have an effect on predators because they're going to run out of food we're actually i think this is we actually try to save wildlife through hunting and through management hunting is used as a tool but i just wanted to make that clear because this is obviously one of those polarizing subjects i guess you know so i wanted to make that clear for anybody listening none of us are ever going to advocate for we don't want any grizzly bear or anything like that it's just actually proper management which in my view i think is actually good for the grizzly bear and all other wildlife around it 
Um, that's important for people who don't understand hunting, I think, to, to, to know there. Um, I'll just add a couple things to that, Charles, because I, I think you and Jeff touched on it really well. And I, I would uh, point out that within that grizzly bear advisory council, as well as the general comments that came in, sure, there's some from left field that talked about crazy things. But the predominant point of view is, yes, grizzly bears are important to have on our landscape, as Jeff pointed out. But there's also a way to manage them in ways that create sustainability, not only for the population, but to, for the ability to hunt them someday. And just as you said, our conservation principles go way back within the hunting community and the trapping community for that plan, for that perspective. Um, and the primary key to minimize the killing of adult females is the major thrust that produces a slow growing but growing grizzly bear population that can produce a surplus. Science-based data confirms that, not only with grizzlies, but with a lot of other species, as you know. And so I think it's important at this point to point out that there is a memorandum of agreement that was signed by three states, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, Right. that really delved into the specific details for allocating discretionary mortality of grizzly bears. And each state has their own mechanisms and their own formulas that determines what they want to do with, I'll just call it the surplus bears. And this was signed by all three parties It evolved into, I think, a, a two or three iterations and it's important to continue those type of things because the framework that comes out of that eventually for individual state-based hunting seasons will not imperil the grizzly bear populations, period. That's something that you don't see the other side talking about at all. Hmm. And, and I think th there's for good reason. You mentioned the fact there's a predator-prey balancing situation that goes on. Well. I think the predators are used as a primary vector in many cases by a lot of these groups to do more than control what they want to see controlled as far as reforming wildlife management. It controls a lot of land use issues. It controls a lot of other things that are on their agendas. And I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on that, but we all know that it's a bigger thing than wildlife management to these same groups because the same players are involved in all of those issues and, de and deals that are going on. Right. So um, I, th I think the other side of this is there's a lot of, I'll just say whining about trophy hunting. Yeah. Partic particularly when it comes to uh, grizzly bears. It's irrelevant to the bears or for that matter to any species that are killed. The populations don't care. And all of our hunts and our sport fisheries have some trophy component and it's never going to go away. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. What, you know, touching on that with in the management plan, um, when would hunt, when would grizzly bear, I don't know if it addresses this, when would one be able to hunt a grizzly bear in Montana if they were delisted and this management plan gets approved? When would that go into effect? Let's just say it was delisted, you know, tomorrow. Well, it's clearly not addressed yet in the management nope. plan, um, no. you know, and, 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 and probably for a good reason, you know, um, we don't know, uh, I guess is the best answer. Um, you know, I, I know it's controversial with black bears, the spring bear season's always controversial and, and what have you, but, yeah. but we don't, we don't know what that would be like. Mm. Um, okay. Got it. And, and then, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to add briefly, uh, I think it'll follow somewhat the same trajectory of creating a framework for a hunting regulated hunting season of grizzly bears, similar to what the wolf did when they came off. Of course, they vacillated back and forth, off on, off on, based on litigation. But it'll go through a pretty lengthy public process, both in what they're going to intend to do under that. And then it has to go through an approval by the Fish and Game Commission in Montana and other states that may have delisting of grizzly bears before it ever sees the light of day of issuing a very limited, probably permit system on a very small yeah. scale. Yeah, for sure. And and 
this, I don't think you touched on this, this management plan, is that, is this for areas outside of Yellowstone, that, that, that ecosystem, what, what areas is, is, does this um, management plan include? Cause I know there's, there's something separate for the, what is the terminology where the bears that are close to or inside of Yellowstone, and then there's sort of the bears that are in the middle of the state further away from Yellowstone. What is, what is, do you know, understand what I'm saying? It's okay. the recovery areas, right? Recovery areas versus their potential range or where they're ranging outside of recovery areas now. Right. That's what they, the uh, the management plan touches on, at least from the maps that I've seen and some of right. the language. And what I like about the plan is it, it does, I mean, it addresses all grizzly bears in Montana, but, uh, you know, we have the, the NCDE, which is generally the Bob Marshall wilderness and surrounding front countries. And um, then we have a portion of the greater Yellowstone uh, on the southwest corner of the state. And then we have um, the cabinet yak uh, area. The bear number there is, is really low, but the NCDE is really the big area for us in Montana on bears. But what I like about this plan is, you know, that the key word is interconnectivity between mm. those, those uh, ecosystems. And, and, We've learned now because we've been in court so many times over these issues that the science and the biologists and all the criteria have been met and we get into a courtroom and a judge says, well, I don't see genetic sharing. I don't see interconnect or connectivity between the ecosystems. And those weren't things that were in the ESA necessarily, but we know it's important. You know, so the plan, as the draft says, it, it, it talks about uh, augmentation, potential genetic sharing between ecosystems and moving bears, uh, you know, from potentially the NCDE to the cabinet yak or the GYE or wherever. Um, so I think the plan is good that way, but it, it also allows for, um, I mean, in Montana, we're seeing bears where there haven't been bears for a hundred years yeah. and they're out in the plains and um, they're a lot of them are getting in trouble, you know? <laughs> so um, if we had a plan where the, the biologists could treat those bears potentially differently than a, a bear that was, you know, in the NCDE. And if the bear was good, you know, not causing trouble, it could be handled uh, left alone in those areas, but if it was causing human conflict or depredation, it could be treated differently. So the flex, I guess the key word in this plan is flexibility. So it's a management plan for the entire state. For the whole okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I would, that's what yeah. my question was. Cause I saw the, the map and, and I kind of on purpose went into this. I don't know if it's a good idea or not when went, went into this, I didn't want to like really look at much. I just wanted to ask you guys questions as if I was a, a person living in California who has no idea about grizzly bear because I don't, we don't have grizzly bear here. So it just not something that I think of. So that's, that was kind of my, my route to take here was to be completely ignorant on all subjects and just ask you these questions. Cause I think it, I think for, for the most part, most people really have no idea about grizzly bear. They have no idea about wolves. They, they see pictures of them. They hear about them. They, you know, I mean, I've, I've been in, um, uh, in, um, uh, Yellowstone. I've also been in Glacier National Park, uh, a lot of backpacking there. I've seen grizzly. That's it. I've seen them <laughs> in Glacier, but I don't know anything about the ins and outs and, you know, what really the problems are. And, you know, I see Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, making videos about stuff or whatever. And that's just kind of what the public sees and you take a side you know, and, and, and a lot of it is, you know, if you're a, if you're a hunter, you kind of understand one side of it. And if you're not a hunter and the only thing you've seen is, you know, some video from Leonardo DiCaprio, then, you know, now you have that opinion. Um, it's just interesting how, 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 um, just crazy this whole subject is. So anyways, that's why I'm asking those questions is just for the pe person who knows nothing like me. So well, I, now that you 
go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. Um, one of the, I guess there's two items. One, see, I, on the other hand, I, I wound up sitting and reading. I'm a nudge like that. I, yeah. so I dug into the, the management plan. And the one thing that I was struck by, and I mean, we're speaking about the, um, the inclusion of hunting as a management tool in this, in this plan. The interesting thing is, is that um, hunting as a tool in this management plan is actually a very, it's a very small part of the overall plan. Um, there's so much more. I mean, it's, there's, I maybe four or five pages that speak to that speak to hunting. There's more that speak to the values that are that were weighed um, both on the hunting and the non-hunting side. Um, you know that those that um, are ordinary citizens versus those that are you know the hunting public and what have you. Um, and so it, that it struck me as you know what the the management portion the hunting management as management is uh it's a small part it's very important but it's it's a small part of of everything that has been uh going on as far as research for this um one of the other things i and i wanted to double check is there's there's actually um with this draft there's there's alternative a and alternative b um with it and i think we're interested in alternative b is that safe to say keith and jeff yeah, hundred percent. In fact, alternative A is a long-term continuation of listing the grizzly bear proposal. Obviously, alternative B goes into the depth that you alluded to, far beyond the hunting aspect. The management—it's a complex plan that, as Jeff pointed out, this Dr. Smith wrote over the two-year course of time integrating all of these things that were done in the past from the early days in the 90s of the early plans that are basically out of date and out of science based data, all the way up to the present delisting requirements and thresholds that have been met. But in order to avoid these continuation or this incessant litigation, they delve into those type of details predominantly on those management category alternative B scenarios. And you can just compare alternative A to B and see the sort of volume they went into on the alternative B scenarios on those alternates on how they would manage the bears, not only with the use of hunting that took up about what, 10 lines versus 180 pages. <laughs> you know, it was really, minimal as you said there Matt but I think the key to it is these grizzly bears accurately described in the plan are conflict prone animals mm. that's the basis on which they had to go into a lot of detail on dealing with the various not only conflicts but potential conflicts that could arise and again they wanted to make this plan in my opinion and I think as Jeff talked to various people in the department, they wanted to make it pretty bulletproof on dealing with those scenarios in the conflict management, predominantly outside of the recovery zone, which are labeled as, I think, demographic monitoring areas. There's so many classifications of areas, whether it's connectivity related or demographic monitoring or designated populations, and you know, just pick an acronym, it's out there. But they painfully went into details about that, knowing that this plan and the EIS would be scrutinized. So I, I think it's, again, I think the theme of today is that we, we want to encourage statewide and national support, which probably doesn't exist very often on positive feedback and commentary. And, and that's the thrust that I think I'll leave it up to, to Jeff's discretion, but I think that's what we want to have come out of this podcast and future uh, abilities working with you guys is we so often hear, in fact, that the, Jeff can describe the latest wolf management seasonal setting process. There were so many well-dressed people from Hollywood there and Australia and London and what have you. We rarely get that in a positive feedback forum on these plans that we do or these seasons that we have. So it's, it's kind of refreshing to engage with you guys 
on that opportunity on a broader scale or a broader range basis. So, and that's what I'm getting out of this is this, this management plan has a lot more to do than hunting. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I'm gathering. Yeah. A little bit about grizzly bears too, you know, in the fact that I worked with them for a long portion of my career is um, they are an apex predator. Mm -hmm. Right. And they, they cause human death. Um, I mean, just, just last summer, um, a lady was a bicyclist who camped in a small town yep. in the front yard of a post office, which I'm sure she felt was safe, it was drugged from her tent by a grizzly bear. And I've had to investigate uh, human death caused by grizzly bears and livestock producers also lose. I mean, I, I counted the other day, we're over 70 cattle that have been killed this year by grizzly bears and we're near 50 sheep. So, and I hunt exclusively in grizzly bear country. I'm a hunter and uh, I see grizzly bears frequently. Um, the other day I was out with my daughter and it, she's a first time hunter. Um, she's not, she's 25, but uh, we were walking back and I saw a couple blood trails of successful hunters dragging their animals out in the snow. And we ran into another hunter and he said, did you see the grizzly tracks? And, and I, I hadn't because there were quite a few tracks in the snow. And he said, last weekend, a guy was dragging out his deer and uh, a grizzly bear basically followed him all the way back to the, the parking area where his car, his, his vehicle was. So, I mean, we live amongst them uh, mm -hmm. and, and some of the bears are good, don't cause any problems. And some of them aren't so good. Uh, we have hunters every year have to surrender their game to bears. Yeah. You know, so anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. With, with that's, Grizzly. That's, go ahead, Matt. Yep. That, um, that's a great statement. We live among them. It's not the other way around. You know, it, this is, no their this is their country um and i think that that's something that it, you know we need to the support for a good management plan i think part of that is to, it, i mean it's public safety right it's inevitable that the grizzly population is going to continue to grow and is going to continue to expand they're going to head out into new territory they i mean they have to they just won't they won't stay in the same area and and giant numbers so it's it's an inevitability that you know they're going to be in places that people haven't encountered them um or that haven't been encountered in you know 80 100 years or whatever so um having more than just hunting having that in place so that people the you know public safety is is taken care of is is important which is that that is, that is i think the that's the topmost um priority for them in this plan is public safety uh, as far as management is concerned obviously the health of the population the grizzly population but uh managing for for safety as well so so when there's a problem grizzly right now what 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 happens if so that bear that that killed that woman in front of the post office what what happened with that bear or or another scenario what happens right now well, they'll, they'll send a team and, you know, they, they try to get the right bear. Um, and, and believe it or not, I've, I've had a human fatality that I was uh, heavily invested in on an investigation. And, and uh, even when you trap the bear at the site, um, we get calls from around the world, basically challenging the, the wildlife agency to prove that that was the offending bear, mm. you know, and even with that, the number of uh, people that, you know, will comment and say, well, the bear was just doing bear, what bears do and, and, and what have you, um, yeah. you get a, a large number of those comments, you know, and, and uh, it's kind of disturbing in a way, um, you know, uh, there are good bears 
and there are, are bears that aren't good bears and uh you know um, but I, I, generally you investigate you try to you know you try to trap the bear and a, a lot of dna work is done sometimes we have to you have to keep the bear you know in captivity until the, the dna work is 100 percent sure that you have the offending bear uh, a lot of times cubs are involved um it's really hard to place cubs in zoos anymore uh the zoos are full they don't they don't want grizzly bears uh, yeah you know so it's not like you can rehab them and and uh if the bear is over a year old or close to a year old, they can be left alone and generally have a pretty good chance of survival. This might seem like a stupid question, but I know there's a big difference between black bear and, and grizzly bear. I've been charged by, I've bear hunted quite a bit, but it's been black bear. I've been charged by black bear where we just surprised each other. Sow had cubs, scariest moment of my life, scariest. 12 minutes of my life actually while i was trying to it just it was just bluff charging me over and over again but um <clears throat> i see you know where i live and 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 different things that happen say with mountain lions or black bear or whatnot um i'll see big differences where there's human pressure put on human pressure by hunting put on animals um, those animals are going to react much different. They're going to have a fear of humans. And then in other areas where there is no hunting of say a, a cougar or a black bear or whatnot, um, they'll come right in your house and just, they don't see you as a threat. Now, is that, this is where I was saying, this might be a stupid question. Is that the same thing with the grizzly? Cause I know grizzlies are a lot more aggressive. You know what I mean? Now is some of this problem that they, they don't have human hunting pressure so they really they don't have any fear of humans and if you apply that pressure then that would be a a, a good healthy fear of humans that they could so there would be less problem bears um if we could start hunting them do you understand I, what i'm saying i do and yeah. i think jeff does I'll, I'll take a stab at it first jeff but i i don't think we'll ever get to the critical mass of being able to hunt enough bears that we would create that fear of humans within that bear population. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the 30 to 50,000 black bears. We're never going to get there in grizzlies in Montana and all these other states. So I'm reluctant to say that it wouldn't create some level of standoffish and fear and reaction, but I don't think we'll get to that point because of the limitation that will be placed on it as far as legal hunting pressure goes. Right. Will somebody else, you know, shoot over their head, start firing rounds at them to scare them? It's already happening, and I don't think we've seen differences. And Jeff, <laughs> you, you chime in here, but I don't think we're going to see that level of uh, pressure to influence their behavior. I, I agree 100%. Um, actually, you know, when I was a warden captain in Missoula, we had numerous instances where hunting was being done in, in uh, heavily populated grizzly areas. And we kind of joke about it and say uh, the dinner bell was rang when the gunshot goes off. But in some cases, that's actually true. Yeah. Um, they, they hear that and they equate that to a gut pile or an animal. And we just got to the point as an agency at the time where uh, if that happened to an individual, you know, we just tell them we'll, we'll give you another tag, you know, and walk away from it. Uh, so I don't, I, I agree with Keith. I, I just don't think there will ever be enough hunting pressure applied that it, that it will uh, deter a bear. Um, they are an apex predator. You know, I mean, you're talking, uh, male grizzlies in Montana, anywhere from 700 to a thousand pounds. And, yeah. uh, that's a big, that's a big animal. I'll just add one more thing to, uh, going back into the grizzly bear advisory council. I sat through a couple of meetings where they brought in experts from Alaska, British Columbia, other parts of the country and, uh, North America. And they, they too said they couldn't scientifically say that that hunting when it was allowed, BC has since rescinded their grizzly season, 
that it did have any effect on those bears activity levels. Yeah, I wonder how long that would take. I just I I bring it up. I'm just I'm just trying to parallel some things. You know, there's we have mountain lions here all the time walking down our sidewalks. They're on the ring cameras. You can't hunt them here. Now that doesn't happen where you can hunt them. Um, I've also learned from watching people like um, Bart George in Washington, hazing isn't scaring mountain lions off. He's getting 12 yards away with playing a podcast on a loudspeaker, but he's got it collared so he knows where the camera, he knows where the lion is. So these ideas that, oh, we can haze and make noises and stuff, and that's going to, you know, scare away mountain lions and whatnot. That doesn't seem to be working either. You know, they're just outside of a school hiding, you know, underneath the, the, the pine trees and that's the kind of stuff that he's that he's documenting um and the same thing with you know black bear you go to um you go to our uh, national park area you go to lake tahoe or whatnot bears just look at you they could care less but where i can black bear hunt they aren't just standing there looking at me that's for sure <laughs> you know so I, I was just wondering with with grizzlies i know they are a, a completely different animal um and and it's it's something that hunters need to be aware of when they do when they do shoot, when they do have a gut pile, you know, you might be able to, a black bear generally doesn't want anything to do with you. A grizzly bear is like, well, that's mine. <laughs> I'm going to come take it. They are a completely different animal. I was just wondering what your, what your, what your take was on that. Um, with this, with this management plan, what do you suggest the public are there a lot of different angles here that the public can get involved in with, you know, let's support this, let's support that. Are we supporting the entire plan? What do you, do we want to, the public to add anything? Um, Cause that's a part of kind of their ask was we'll develop this plan based on, um, you know, public response, which is sort of opening up uh, to, to complete wildness if, if that's what they're really basing it on. But what is it we want the public to do here? with regards to this plan as it, as it exists right now. I'll take a stab at it here first, Charlie. And that is that I think the first order that we'd like to see is support for the plan in its alternative B, I guess it is in terms of what that uh, process is currently viewing alternative B as the preferred option. And we would think this support by the public would, would be, beneficial in that regard, but I don't think it would hurt to include support for the plan, be it small that it is, supporting the hunting role of hunting as part of that support for the plan. I can assure you that the major theme of comments coming in from the other side is absolutely no hunting. And this commission, or I'm sorry, the department, I guess it is at this time, is gonna get just overwhelmed with that comment, no honey, no honey, no honey. Okay. And I think lim and I think lim the other side of it is, I think they're gonna be also, and, and this is subject to uh, interpretation, but the general public and their mutual ideology thinking is gonna create in these connectivity areas, which are the areas outside of the recovery zones. Everything in between is gonna be a connectivity zone or a management, uh, demographic management area. They're gonna to wanna to see that area treated the same as the recovery zone with limited right. controls and limited management and limited, uh, I'll just say, and they're gonna want repressive restrictions within those on humans. Don't forget this, the primary point of this plan is to manage grizzly bears, not people. And I, I think that's a distinction that we want to hammer in is, and the, the plan goes into that. They go into their areas where they need to discourage bears from being under the human safety aspect. So I, I think as far as reaching out for comments, we're going to want to provide an opportunity for the public to weigh in on supporting the plan under the restrictions that they've gone into about those connectivity areas. Restrictions being not being too tolerant of bears where they're not wanted. What's I don't know the, if I said that right, Jeff, but yeah, that's what we've well, talked you, about in the past. Yeah, is, yeah is, you did. And, you know, Montana is, uh, we're still, you know, uh, pretty sparsely populated, but we're seeing growth um, 
you know, every, every year subdivisions are, are going up. And, and a lot of these areas, uh, they interchange. And when I say they, I mean the other side um, or the antis, they use this interconnect or this connectivity or corridor. You'll hear that term used frequently. And, and they think in their thinking that they can create these corridors between these ecosystems where bears will travel with no problem. And that's just, that's just a falsehood that, I mean, we have interstates, we have highways, we have people. Uh, I've seen grizzly bears be euthanized because they've killed chickens. And, and you think about that, chickens. You can buy a chicken for five bucks, you know? I mean, so uh, to think that you can establish these corridors where grizzly bears will travel safely from the, the GYE to the NCDE, whether it be with uh, creation of new wilderness areas, which there's that effort, which we don't wanna see that happen, um, and, or uh, maybe paying a landowner for grizzly bear habitat, trying to create these zones or corridors for grizzly bears to travel. And, and that's just not gonna work. They're doing it on their own now. I had a grizzly bear was between Keith and I just a couple of years ago on a golf course, just three miles from my house, you know? Hmm. And uh, so they're showing up in places where they've never, you know, we've never heard of them being before. Um, What's the future look like both ways? So what, it, that might be a really tough question to, to answer, but let's say plan B, right? That get, that goes through. What does that future look like? What can that turn into? And let's say it doesn't, let's say there's no, let's say there's no hunting or take out anything else. You know, what's, what's the future look like both ways if it goes with the anti-hunters the other side if it goes their way or if it goes our way what are both of those futures can you what do you think it'll look like 50 years 25 i don't know down the road keith you want to take one side of that and i'll take the other <laughs> you want to take the anti or the hunting side plan b or plan a <laughs> well i'll take the anti side okay Not that oh, to be clear them, okay but... so plan a is that that's the anti-hunter side is that what you well would... Not the alternatives that are in the plan, okay. Charlie. Let, let, yeah, let me yeah, be clear. Okay. Be, yeah. Because I think what you're asking is, what happens if we don't write a good plan and there's no management? Yeah, so, yeah. And, and maybe that's a better way to frame it. But sure. if that occurs and the antis win or they litigate or however you want to describe it, and this plan doesn't come to fruition and no delisting occurs, then we're going to have more grizzly bears on the landscape, more conflict, more human safety issues, less tolerance for the bears. And to build less tolerance for the bears is to, is to not only doom their future, but it's gonna hurt the overall landscape. It's gonna create divisive areas that are right now at pretty peak levels, but it's gonna grow tenfold. So I, I think at some point you're gonna see, and, and again, a, the antis, come in many different shapes and forms, but I think you're going to see them come to a point of realization where they got to buy into this or it's going to get worse. And if it gets worse, then it'll go the other way. Um, Jeff, you can, you can chime in on that, but. Uh, yeah, if, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, we're to the point now where uh, the governor just spoke at uh, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation uh, summit meeting in Bozeman the other day. You know, and he, and he relayed a pretty good story of, of a, a lady that confronted him about she can't let her kids play in her yard. And mm -hmm. She happens to live on the Blackfoot Indian Reservation, and she has to electric fence around her yard to protect her children from playing in the yard from the bears. So I, I think you'll just get more and more of that. Um, if you go with this plan, um, I don't think hunting is going to necessarily play that big a role in the grizzly bears future. Even if it's allowed, it, it's, it's not going, it's going to be such a minuscule part of the, of the grizzly bear management. It, um, you know, but 
I, I think wildlife, state wildlife agencies have proven, and Montana definitely has proven with the management of wolves for the last 12 years, that we're not gonna wipe them out. We're gonna manage them like any game species that we manage. Um, we have, you know, more wolves today than, than what the antis wanna tell you we have. And uh, we set the quota fairly high, you know, 40%, and we don't get to the quota. It takes people that have that ability, that skill and that desire and that knowledge to go out and get them. Uh, and that's just not happening. And the same with the grizzly bear. I, I, I think it could be managed by the state tomorrow and with some limited hunting. And, and when I say limited hunting, you know, you might follow up with a question like, well, what do you think limited hunting is? Yeah. You know, uh, I, to be honest, I, I don't think there would be more than 20 bears a year harvested by hunters. That That's just the number I'm grabbing out of the air, but I don't see large numbers of grizzly bears being harvested by hunters. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what's the, okay. What is the plan now? And what is this new plan adding that doesn't exist now? So I think you, you've been, I mean, 20 grizzly bear a year, that's obviously not going to have, um, I'll bring in New Jersey really quick. So the, the, the governor, he banned uh, black bear hunting in New Jersey in 2018 right. campaigned on it. And then uh, recently he said, uh, we need a season because there's way too many problems with black bear and Houston sued and that lasted for three days and that got overturned. And now there's a black bear season in New Jersey because things just got too bad and they needed to bring hunting back in because hunting, it's it's different type of hunting, obviously black bear and grizzly, but hunting plays a significant role in, in that. Um, with this, what is what is being introduced in this new plan that that isn't there right now well i think a couple of things that are introduced besides the hunting aspect that could occur at a future date if the numbers and the science proves it to be doable the conflict management and how you deal with bears and how you manage bears is i think one of the key differences between the old segments of the plans both a and b that existed for yellowstone as well as uh, NCDE. And by the way, both of those areas, Yellowstone and NCDE, have what's known as conservation strategies. This plan, this new plan, identifies what those are in terms of how certain bears will be managed, not only in the demographic areas which are outside of the recovery zone, but some of these connectivity areas as well. So I, I think to answer your question in a short version is, if this plan's approved, it gives more discretion and it gives more flexibility to manage the uncertainty that comes with the unpredictability of each separate bear. They're all different. They're all, uh, they all react differently. And this plan would allow fish and game agencies, tribal agencies, wildlife services, and all of these agencies, both state and federal that are currently active in the management, to do even more based on the occurrence specifics of the bears that are in conflict. It also allows this augmentation and translocation of bears at the discretion of the agencies, which is the sort of side component of hunting. Hunting isn't the only way to control some of the populations and other aspects, but some of this augmentation could be. And the augmentation is gonna trans for bears from point A to point B to seed those recovery zones. Maybe it's the Bitterroot or the Cabinet Yak or the Selkirk or whatever. So other areas could receive bear, Montana bears if this plan is approved. I think that's right, Jeff, the way I read that uh, alternative yeah. B. That's how I read it. What's the effects on on that grizzly are having specifically to Montana on um, ungulate populations or any other what's what's is that as as their numbers grow are you seeing um, any other data to be alarmed about with you know elk or deer or, or whatnot does that is that on your radar you know it it it, it is definitely 
in some areas, like uh, region one is the northeast corner of Montana. And uh, through this elk management plan that we just went through, um, one of the members of the uh, elk management committee, uh, one of his recommendations was to uh, manage elk where they're not. <laughs> and, and I had scratched my head and I had to go back and, and uh, what do you mean by manage elk where they're not? And what he meant was in region one, it's the most predator rich area in our state. It, it, in region one, they harvest more black bears than any uh, region in the state. They harvest uh, a high number of lions and historically they've been the leader of the number of lions harvested. And they also have the largest density of grizzly bears in their region. And if you go back historically in which this member of this group did, uh, he found where it was documented that there were uh, populations of elk like approaching 30,000 in, in region one. And uh, now it's just, it's like 3000 elk in region mm. one, you know? So I'm sure that's, you know, more than just grizzly bears, but um, lions, black bears, subdivisions, habitat change, fire, all of that plays, plays a role. But uh, to come out and say that grizzly bears are having a profound effect on ungulates, I don't know if I can say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure in certain locations they are, um, but uh, grizzly bears' diets are pretty, pretty, everything from a huckleberry and a, a moth to roadkill or a chicken or whatever. I mean, they eat a lot of different things. So mm -hmm. I don't see them focusing just on ungulates alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. There's just some, some recent studies that I've, I've looked at it mostly had done had to do with was, black bear and, and mountain lion um but um two studies the the blue mountain elk herd in uh in washington state i think 75 percent of the calves were wiped out and mountain lions were were the uh were the primary culprit of that and black bear being number two but it's a huge huge issue and then there's a, a study in mendocino county in california where basically the black tail population is in dire straits and they actually um attributed that to to black bear um killing so many fawns um so i just I had some questions if the, if you had any info on that for for grizzlies because well, you know, again i'm just i'm really not familiar with them we're yet to understand what impact the additive pressure grizzly bears will have on our ungulates and other wildlife populations charlie because they're not established everywhere yet either. That's a good, how many, do you have any idea how and, many grizzly are in Montana right now? Is there a thousands? Just, just and, thousands. Okay. Yeah. And here's, here's, here's the latest number, Jeff, you, you're probably more on top of it than I am, but I said I was the color commentary guy. So here it goes. You know, the last numbers that we've heard was somewhere in the 11 to 1200 range in the NCDE and surrounding areas and well over 800 within the Yellowstone greater area or the ecosystem. There's some wandering bears in between that probably never get census. There's also bears up in the Northwest that come and go from both Canada and Idaho. Same thing down in the, the Bitterroots, ironically, have not had any resident populations known to be present, even though they wander from time to time and come and go. But I think it's probably supportable to say that there's a couple thousand in Montana at the very least at this point. Do you yeah. know what it was? Um, I don't know, 10 years ago, what was the grizzly bear population? Well, you know, they did this study recently, Jeff, you'll, you'll remember this down in Yellowstone where they went through a recalculation of bears Yeah, and it grew substantially. I want to say probably by 20%. Yeah, it went from like 750 bears to over a thousand bears just by changing the method that they use to count the bears. Yeah, uh, which is is of course ripe for argument by the other side. Yeah, uh, they're 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 that's not science in their favor. So that that's yeah. got to be bad science, you know. So, um, but yeah, I I agree with the the number that uh, you threw out there. Um, 
I retired 10 years ago, but they, they had a pretty good genetic study, a uh, hair snag study in the NCDE when I was there. And they got a pretty good, matter of fact, they were shocked at the number of bears that they, that they were able to locate. They didn't think that they, there were that many there. Um, so yeah, I would say a good guess would be a couple thousand bears in the state. So that answers the question why there isn't a whole lot of data on their effects on ungulate, <laughs> on the ungulate population. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, com- again, a completely just a looking at a completely different species and, and population, of course. When's the last time a grizzly bear was hunted in Montana? Any, uh, when? The early 90s? I okay. think it was 1992 was the last year that a grizzly bear was legally hunted in montana okay obviously that's kind of strange since they were listed as threatened but um not endangered until i think 96 or thereabouts but um and again that it wasn't like they killed a whole lot of them then that was like a rare occurrence right got it yeah there's uh i found it it's page Page 102, there's a timeline of changes to grizzly bear hunting in Montana. There you go. So that's the, that's just a nice little timeline. But above that, it talks about the history of grizzly bear hunting in Montana. So. Does it say what the, the, the last year a bear was harvested? Let's see. So, yeah, it would have been 91 because 92, the commission omits grizzly bear hunting season from biennial regulations. State's authority to establish grizzly bear hunting season in NCDE is removed by the Fish and Wildlife Service in a federal rule. So it would have been, would have been, looks like spring, spring of 91 was the last one because fall hunting was canceled due to federal court preliminary injunction on hunting them. So it's been over 30 years. Got it. So it's been a really long time. And this, you probably have to search for this too, but do you, did you see what the population of grizzly bear was back then? Does anybody know what it was in 90? No. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Uh, it's all really interesting to me. And grizzly bear is a absolutely fascinating, fascinating creature um, that I, that I don't, I just like looking at it. You know, I love watching the, videos and anything i can see on on grizzly bear and personally i'd love to hunt a grizzly bear someday with my bow i don't know if that's ever going to happen but it's just one of those great challenges that i i think i would like to do you know um right up there with the moose that's that's the other thing with my bow that that'd be kind of my sort of my dream hunts um well is there anything else that um well what we're going to do we're going to develop sort of an action and break all this down and you know, basically say, here's what's going on. Here's a, here's B. Um, here's why we think you should support B and get the public involved, you know, in that, in as many ways as, as possible. Um, is there anything else you think we should go over or, or, or talk about here to, to help here? Or Matt, do you have any questions? I don't have any other questions at the moment. No, this has been, uh, it's been great to pick your brains on this and get your perspective. Um, definitely given, given us a lot, um, a lot of background to be able to, uh, to put to use, try to motivate folks to get involved, you know, with comments and what have you. So. One thing I would just close with is, is I think there's, there's an important component to whatever you develop as a comment structure to ask the public to weigh in and support state-based management of their own wildlife. Uh, The longer we struggle with this federal intervention on any species, generally speaking, the worse it is for people living in the state that that exists in. And it doesn't matter what the species are, but it, 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 it's particularly frustrating with the bears as it was with the wolves when we go back and forth with the contrived reasons that these NGOs throw at the wall through their attorneys 
and the federal court agrees with. So I, I think the sooner that the public weighs in and, and, and Montana's probably the best, we've got four recovery zones in our state. Montana's the, the deserving state to get state management control of grizzly bears. And that comes with alternative yeah. B, correct? Correct. Right. And, and, and something too, if I could just in closing, just because I have some knowledge of the state and the game department, um, the current FWP or Fish, Wildlife and Parks Agency does the yeoman share of work of grizzly bear management now, you know, so it's not like it's this uh, big turnover or big change of, of how things would happen. We manage bears now. Um, really, the thing that the federal listing does is it puts uh, binders on how we manage those bears, and, and they dictate, you know, uh, when a bear can be uh, euthanized or where a bear should be moved or whatever. And uh, the state can do that just fine. I mean, like I said we're doing ninety percent of the work now, and. Uh, to put this plan into place and put it back into state management, um, the bear will only prosper. It won't, it won't go away. And uh, um, the numbers aren't gonna dip down. They're just gonna continue to grow. It'll just be, it'll just be managed in a much more flexible way. For the betterment of Montana. Absolutely. Specifically, I think that's what's important here, right? Is yep, is absolutely. it's for the betterment of what's going on in Montana with the people in Montana, in your Montana yeah. situation with your Montana Grizzlies. Not, yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah. that might seem kind of, but that's what the problem is. You're not you're not allowed to handle your own grizzly bears, essentially, yeah. and your own and your own issues that you have there. Yeah, um, and I know I I know what the other side's going to say to that of course that's that's there they always know better they always know better yeah um do you have a do you have a website or anything like that that you can um direct people to with your guys's with your nonprofit? Uh, we do What's that? let us have it's, it uh, it's uh, just montana sfw.org Mon so sp spelled out Montana SFW.org. Okay. MTSFW oh. at or dot dot org. Dot org. Yeah. <laughs> you forgot I'm your gonna, website there make, for a second. I'm gonna just make sure I have it right. So yeah. I make, make sure that I don't go to it very often. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I can figure it out also and yeah, that, put it that's, up later or whatever. But. That's it. MTSF.org. MTSF. M dot Montana. Yeah. M, yeah. M is a yep. mule. There yep. You Are you on, is that on, do you have a social media? Uh, I'm afraid to ask this question since with the website, but are you on Instagram or Facebook or whatnot for us to follow, follow that or, or no? Yeah, we're on Facebook. You are. Okay. Yeah. What's the, what's yeah. that page? Same thing. Same thing. Awesome. Uh, actually, actually, there's a there's a dash between MT and SFW. I don't know if that matters, but it's MT for, dash SW for SF. the website. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll look it up and and yeah. put it up there so that's easier to figure out. You have to understand, we're like most sportsmen's organizations. We're made up of older guys that aren't computer literate. <laughs> and we we do have a young lady that uh does take care of our web page and our facebook page so awesome well i want to thank uh keith and jeff both of you guys for being here for this and um matt i'm sure will matt's going to help develop this uh this action and kind of write out some things um with with your guys's assistance and I also think even talking to Joe yesterday, I think the American Bear Foundation, they're gonna they're gonna take some comments from them and put that into uh the action and and um 
you know, just just help develop different comments that people can send in that they can choose from or whatnot. But just want to thank you guys both for being here. Um, and hopefully it it educated some people on on what's going on and kind of look forward to seeing where this goes because it seems like if this gets passed, then you're really going to have a lot of other things to work on. Um, you know, what with the whole hunting side of thing, you know, what will the what will the quota be? What will the take be? Uh, lots of different things to work on there, I think, which would be to be really interesting. But um, thanks again. And I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Okay, guys, I want to thank you again for tuning into the Focus Hunting Podcast. It's coming at you as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. Quick shout out to the sponsors of this show, Vortex Optics, the best in optics, period. AKU Boots, you to your feet. Now, if you guys go check out the uh, show notes, um, you're going to find some promo codes. Use them, save a bunch. And uh, if you guys could please leave us a rating or review, we really appreciate that. And uh, until next time, love you guys.